I've been keeping an eye on Craigslist for a good vertical bandsaw for the shop. Ideally, a Dewall, with a blade welder. An older model, because they look cooler. At least 16 inches, maybe bigger, but not the 36 inch monsters that are commonly available because people get them cheap and then realize that they're catastrophically oversized for their shop and immediately sell them on to the next sucker. With this list of requirements, I had more or less resigned myself to buying one off eBay someday and making a small vacation out of driving to the Rust Belt to pick it up. Which, while pricey, sounds like a lot of fun, if I ever had the money. And then, a few weeks ago, a miracle occurred. An almost mint condition 1975 20-inch Dewall showed up on Craigslist, just an hour north of Seattle, for an incredibly low price. This is what saving accounts are for, and within a couple hours I was paying a moderate stack of cash and loading it into a rented trailer. While it wasn't an absolute leviathan like a 36-inch model, it was still very large. Too large to get in through the garage door was still on the trailer, for instance. And my gantry crane is too tall to get out, so I had to remove its casters and slide it out through the garage door using a Johnson bar in brute force. I realized this scenario was probably going to happen again in the future, so I made some crane upgrades in the midst of everything else. I added thick rubber feet to replace the original tall metal casters, then welded on some of those workbench casters that can be flipped up or down. They aren't strong enough to be engaged with any real load on the crane, but they're more than strong enough to roll it into place and then drop it down onto the rubber feet before hoisting anything. In this configuration, it now rolls out under the garage door with no problems. I'll let you know how this ends up working in the future. Once the saw was on the ground, it was easily moved inside the shop on a pallet jack, and I could start to appreciate what I had acquired. Now, it could have stayed in the outer shop, but at the cost of some floor space I'd rather save for working on large sculptural projects. And it just makes more sense as a resident of the inner shop, being 1. a serious machine tool that b. doesn't make a big mess. Unfortunately, it was considerably taller than the doorway to the inner shop. In fact, because there is a 6 inch step down into the inner shop, it was actually taller than the ceiling of the inner shop when sitting in the outer shop, so even tearing out the entire doorframe wouldn't have done it. So I took some measurements and thought about it. Laying it on its side wouldn't work. The whole thing is almost 700 kilograms. I could probably manage to lay it down safely in the outer shop using the gantry crane, but standing it back up again in the inner shop would be fraught, if not impossible. But I was feeling stubborn, so I did some advanced computer modeling. And I realized that the 6 inch step into the inner shop was a feature, not a bug. If I could tip the saw back by 15 degrees, it could be rolled through the doorway onto blocking, and then lowered to the ground. At that point, it could be tipped fully vertical again, theoretically just barely clearing the doorframe in the process. That was a big conditional, however. Could it rest stably at a 15 degree angle? It seemed possible. The CG should be low, since the motor and transmission are all on the base. But it was fundamentally an empirical question, and there is only one way to resolve those. So I removed as much weight as possible, and tested it hooked to the gantry crane making sure there was never much slack in the chain hoist. And it worked. At 15 degrees, I could give it a full body shove and it didn't begin to tip over. So I guessed I had no choice but to try. First I made some custom skids to go under the saw made out of 2x4s. These would be screwed and clamped in place to keep the saw on tippy toes for the operation. They needed a 15 degree bevel. That's far too shallow for a normal miter cut, so I had to get creative with the table saw. Have I mentioned the table saw scares me more than any other tool I have? The next day I started, first moving the saw into position in front of the doorway, then lifting one side so the angled skids could be inserted. I attached a cargo strap around a board that runs across the rafters. This was purely as an emergency backup, to prevent a catastrophic fall from even starting. In retrospect, I should have used the chain hoist and not a cargo strap, as adjusting it was a real pain and sometimes put me in dangerous positions. I was just being lazy and not wanting to rig the train hoist up there, and I have no excuse for that. A stout stack of 2x8s served as blocking on the inner side, with some stops screwed in on the top just in case it started to roll out of control. The move itself was done on half-inch pipe as rollers. For those of you who live in more civilized countries, know that there is nothing half-inch about half-inch pipe. Not the inner diameter, not the outer diameter, not the wall thickness. Indeed, none of the pipe sizes are anywhere close to the size they claim to be. It's exceedingly silly. Everything went well at first. It got up to the transition to the wood blocking and then rolled partially on it just fine. Unfortunately, this was the point that I realized it was getting less and less stable. Suddenly there was little to no weight on the front of the saw at all, and it was all precariously balanced on the rollers at the back end. 
There were a couple very hairy moments indeed here, where I had to carefully back it up while not letting it tip, while being very careful never to stand in what I could only think of as the squish zone. My mistake, as far as I can figure out, was something no one with my amount of metrology training should ever have done. I assumed surfaces were parallel just because they looked like they were. They're so easy to draw that way! But concrete floors are just goopy mud that has been cleverly frozen into place, and very little about it is actually planar unless someone has put a hell of a lot of effort into making it so. Not surprisingly, that effort does not seem to have been made when my shop floor was poured. There is a bit of a lip as the floor approaches the step into the inner shop, it turns out. Not much, but enough to invalidate all my careful balance tests. I got it back into a more or less stable configuration. While thinking about what the bleep to do next, I decided to improve the stability by clamping on some long beams that made up part of my Time Machine's installation. I added weights onto the end of those, including my 125 pound anvil. It's pretty nice having canonically heavy objects around sometimes. And then I went to lunch and thought about it. Upon my return, it hadn't fallen over. And in fact it felt pretty stable now. So carefully, very, very carefully, I resumed moving it forward. After a bunch of back and forth, I got it flush with the upper door frame but the base still wasn't all the way into the inner shop, meaning it couldn't be dropped down yet. The removal of some door trim got me another two centimeters, and that was enough. The base was in. The blocking came up without too much trouble, though maneuvering around the counterweights wasn't easy. And then I could start tipping it back fully vertical, the last real test of this whole silly idea. It fit under the door, just. I could have removed some more door trim if needed, so it wasn't actually that close. And there it was, sitting free and clear in the inner shop. In yet more retrospection, to be completely honest, I don't think I would do this again. I'm glad the saw is in the inner shop, but it was a silly plan to begin with, and it came far too close to disaster. I need to make sure not to let this anomalous victory affect my priors in the future. With the saw in its final resting place, at least as far as this mortal is concerned, I could finally start to set it up, which raised a new and interesting problem. It needs three-phase power. So... Mains power is alternating current, meaning the voltage is going up and down many times a second. 60 times a second where I live, but 50 is common in other parts of the world. In residential circuits here, it is going between positive 169 volts and negative 169 volts. But that's just the peaks and troughs. Root mean square, or RMS, gives a better idea of how powerful it is on average, so they're usually described as being 120 volts. That works fine for smaller appliances. But what about big things like dryers and welders? There are 240 volt circuits for those, but it isn't just a single wire going from plus 240 to negative 240. Instead, there are two wires, each with 120 volts AC on it as before, but they're 180 degrees out of phase with each other. This just means that when one is all the way up, the other is all the way down. Think of them going around a circle, 60 times a second, with the voltage being their height in the y-axis. When we say that they're out of phase, it means they're not at the same point on this circle at the same time. Being out of phase by 180 degrees simply means that they are always opposite each other. By themselves, these are both just another 120 volt circuit. But if you measure across the two, you get a difference that is going from positive 240 to negative 240. And there is your beefier circuit. Note that this is still called single phase power. It's also called split phase power, which is a much better description. Technically, there are two phases in operation, but they're 180 degrees apart. The terminology is a bit sloppy, because it's easy to generate the inverse of a phase, so they're considered more or less the same thing. It can be done using a specific kind of transformer. In fact, that's exactly what happens not far from your house. A single phase line goes in at the top, and split phase lines come out on the side at a much lower voltage. And that's fine for residential use, but it has some drawbacks for industrial uses. Think about a very simplified motor. Changing magnetic fields on the stationary part, the stator, induce current flow in the rotating part, the rotor. These induced currents create their own magnetic fields, which get pushed by the stator fields, spinning the rotor. The thing is, a single phase of power can only create a magnetic field that flips back and forth in direction. Split phase doesn't help here, because when it comes to creating magnetic fields, an inverse phase is the same thing as running a wire with the original phase in the opposite direction. So split phase can provide more oomph, but it doesn't change the design of the motor. If the rotor is already rotating, that's fine. The torque generated on it is asymmetrical, and it continues to spin. But if it isn't rotating, the torque generated by the magnetic field is the same in both directions. It cancels itself out. The rotor just sits there, continuing not to spin. 
Not spinning is bad, because the point of a motor is to spin, but also because you're generating all of the heat without any of the cooling, so it'll likely become an X motor pretty quickly. This can be fixed by adding a secondary winding, with some big capacitors so its magnetic field is out of phase with the main winding. You also need to be able to turn this off, because it can burn out easily. This is usually done with a centrifugal switch that disconnects once the rotor is spinning fast enough. But basically, the bigger a motor is, the more expensive it becomes to run it on single or split phase power. What if instead of a single main winding, we had three? If these were spaced around the stator at 120 degrees, and if they were powered with three phases, each 120 degrees apart, the overall magnetic field being produced would rotate instead of just flipping back and forth. Now the motor can start from a dead stop, because the rotating magnetic field provides torque whether or not the rotor is already rotating. With this design, you don't need all the special startup equipment. Three-phase power means big motors get much cheaper. There are also some significant advantages to being able to carry more power on smaller wires, a cost which can quickly become very significant over the size of a building, even when copper prices aren't leaving cis lunar space. Three phases is how power is generated and how it is transmitted right up until it comes into your house. Look at power lines. There are almost always three wires, or a multiple of three. First at very high voltages, then lower ones. Somewhere near your house, one of those phases goes into a transformer that drops it down to line voltage, generating a split phase pair in the process. Sometimes power companies will be willing to bring the full three phases into a residential structure, but it's a very expensive process. They have to install a special transformer and run more lines. But usually they don't want to do it at all. What this means is that if, like me, you only have residential split phase power in your shop, running a three phase motor is hard. This is annoying because all the really fun industrial equipment requires it. And because it's so hard to use for most people, there's less competition for that equipment. Doubly annoying. So if you want three phase at home, you'll have to make it yourself. Unfortunately, this isn't easy to do. We saw how you can invert an AC signal to get something 180 degrees out of phase with it, but generating any other offset, such as the 120 degrees that we want, is much harder. One attractive solution is a variable frequency drive, or VFD. This uses clever electronics to slice up incoming single or split phase power and rearrange it on the fly to generate three phase. They're cheap, and they can actually generate any frequency output you want, not just whatever the input frequency is. This means they can run motors at variable speeds, which can be really convenient if the device in question didn't originally have some kind of speed control. But VFDs are very limited in their application. They can only run a motor. No work lamps, no blade welders, nothing else. And they can only run a single motor. Every motor needs their own VFD, which can be a pain on things like big mills, which might have two or three separate motors. And they have to be directly connected to the motor. There can't even be a switch along the way. They have to completely replace whatever control system was originally on the device. This would have been the sensible choice, honestly. But then the blade welder I was so excited to get would have been useless unless I could manage to wire it up separately. And I would have to mount an ugly plastic control box on the saw and use that instead of the big cool buttons it already has. And with the VFD providing speed control, I wouldn't be using the cool mechanical CVT and gearbox built into the saw. It would just be a lot less cool overall. More importantly, I reasoned disingenuously with myself, this will almost certainly not be the last three-phase device I acquire. Why not spend a little bit now and make life easier in the future? So I went with the other option, a rotary phase converter, or RPC. Like I said before, you can get a three-phase motor to start running on split phase at the cost of a bunch of expensive electronics, including some big scary capacitors. That's most of what an RPC does. But because a motor and generator are really the same thing, once the motor is running, the inductance inside of it is automatically generating a third phase. It's not a motor or a generator now. It's a spinning electromagnetic thing, and it's called an idler in this context. It doesn't do anything else. It just sits and spins. Split phase goes in, three phase comes out. Note that this isn't quite perfect three phase, as the original split phase input is still 180 degrees apart. The new third phase is 90 degrees out of phase with these, resulting in a lopsided phase diagram like this. It still works for running three-phase equipment, however, at the cost of a small percentage of motor power. Installing the RPC wasn't too hard, though I'm far from being an electrician. First, the control panel had to be mounted. This contains the big scary capacitors needed to get the idler running. This has power coming in from a 50 amp 240 circuit. A three-phase plus ground power cable runs to the idler. 
Another three-phase plus ground output runs to the saw. That's it. Very simple in theory, a bit fiddly in practice. I first got it running over a temporary connection to make sure everything worked. And it did. I was thinking I might hide the idler on the other side of the wall, but it's surprisingly quiet in practice. Way quieter than the bandsaw, certainly. Finally, I spent an evening installing conduit from the RPC to the saw. I included two blank outlets along the way to support future acquisitions. It would be better at that point to have it all going through a three-phase circuit breaker, with a different circuit for every device, but that's a complication for future me to deal with. And with that, the bandsaw was fully installed. And it worked. At long last, I could learn all its subsystems. It's a beautiful old thing, built in a way few things are today. Which is mostly a good thing, as things used to be much more expensive. Seriously, dig up an old Sears catalog and do inflation adjustments on prices for things like socks. But I'm explicitly indulging in aesthetics here, not practicality. Look at this mechanism for raising and lowering the blade guard. It must weigh 10 kilos by itself. It came with a blower to clear chips, but I could barely feel any air coming out. The hoses were clear, so I pulled the compressor itself. This runs off the main motor via belt drive. It has these sliding vanes on the inside, made of some light plastic or maybe graphite? They slide because the hub is mounted eccentrically to the chamber, creating the compression effect. And this way they naturally wear down to a tight fit, without needing to be super precisely machined. Nice. Cleaned up and mounted back together, the airflow was a lot better. Still not great, though. If I end up wanting more, I might just plumb it into the shop air system, but it would be a shame not to make use of such a neat little mechanism. I also set up the auto feed system, which is adorably brute force. It isn't one of the fancy hydraulic table systems, just a chain attached to a weight through pulleys. This wheel lets you move the weight in and out on its lever arm, changing how hard the chain is pulled. This foot treadle releases the weight and lets you reset the whole thing. And it works! Not very precise without setting up a guide, but it sure cut through that half-inch bar like styrofoam. I don't know how often I'll use it. Maybe if I need to cut up an engine block or something? It was informative to realize how hard it was pulling, even in its lightest setting, though, and how effortlessly the saw kept up with that. I need to feel free to push a lot harder when feeding by hand. And finally, the blade welder. It does what it says on the tin. It welds blades. You can use it to fix a broken blade. Or you can buy reels of bandsaw blade and weld up whatever size you need. You can also do some cool tricks like drilling a hole in the part, breaking a blade, feeding it through the hole, welding it back together, putting the blade back on the saw, sawing out the inside of the part, breaking the blade, removing the part, welding the blade back together, and remounting it on the saw. Will I ever need to do that? No idea, but I sure like knowing I could do it. The welder isn't too complicated. This tool lets you cut a blade. It actually shears out a little segment about 4 millimeters wide, so you can cut out an old weld completely. To weld, the two ends are held in these clamps, so that they are just touching each other. Then you push down on this lever and... Woo! And my new phone does 1 8 speed slow-mo, so let's watch that again. Next, you anneal the blade, which softens the weld so it isn't brittle. And finally, you can clean up the weld using the built-in grinder, checking if it is the correct thickness using this gauge. And that's it, the latest addition to the shop. It is a handsome beast, I think, and I look forward to using it. Cheers!